This is a terrible idea, my girlfriend said. I waved expansively at the stretch of trees nearby, communing with nature, exploring, detoxing from technology. What could go wrong? She squinted at me, her brown eyes narrowed. If this is supposed to be a digital detox, shouldn't we stop the Zoom meeting? No way, I shook my head. I want to enjoy time with you while I can. A three hour time difference might not seem like much, but when it's your first ever long distance relationship, everything is harder than you expect. Gabriella and I had grown up together, but had only started dating the past six months. Six months was long enough that we had outlasted all of our other friends' relationships. But I constantly worried that someone would meet her, realize how amazing she was, and steal her away. She was nearly six feet tall, with beautiful, dark brown eyes and black hair. Meanwhile, I was short and plain. We had never been this far apart for this long. Trust me, it hadn't been my idea to pack up and move across the country. In fact, I had had no say in it at all. The second dad told me that he got the job offer in Maine, I knew things would change and not in my favor. And I was right. One moment, I was hanging out with Gabriella at the beach, holding her hand in mine. The next, forcibly transplanted all by myself into a cold, dreary house surrounded by a huge freaking forest. Okay, technically not all by myself, because dad was here too. But still. Being a teenager sucks. And it sucks even more when your dad decides that his version of a midlife crisis is embracing his latent hippie tendencies and dropping everything to live in the woods. I thought of my mom then and had a sharp pang of missing her. If she was still alive, dad wouldn't have wanted to move. It had been two years since that drunk driver had ruined our lives and his. Two years, but it felt like she had died just yesterday. I would think that I was okay, and then something would remind me of her, and I would miss her all over again. To distract myself from my thoughts, I pointed at a suspicious-looking bush. Is that a patch of poison ivy? Gabriella rolled her eyes. I could tell that even though our call lagged slightly, leaving our audio out of sync with in our mouths. Not everything is poison ivy. Hey, not everyone is a Girl Scout, an Eagle Scout, whatever you were. Henry David Thoreau, I was not, unlike Gabriella. I'd be happy to stay indoors with a bag of popcorn and a good Netflix show for the rest of my life. I never understood the appeal of camping, or even hiking. No plumbing, poison ivy, mosquitoes, gnats, and bears. No thanks. And ticks. I frowned at her. What are ticks? They're parasitic bugs that feed on blood. And they can give you Lyme disease. Uh, I promptly made the decision to never go outside ever again. Alright, I'm out. Do you want to stay up late and watch The Ritual together? Gabriella said something, but the zoom call glitched momentarily, freezing her face into a pixelated blur. I tried waving my phone around as if that would help. Babe, you're breaking up, I can't hear you. I was about to say more when I heard it. The sound of bells. I stopped waving my phone to listen because the sound was weirdly entrancing. It started off as a delicate chiming. The kind of bells you would expect to hang over the door to an old lady's tea shop or something. And then the sound changed. It got deeper and louder. So loud that I could feel it vibrating through my whole body. And it seemed as though now I couldn't move. Not just that I didn't want to. Mel, Gabriella's voice broke me out of my trance. Despite how chopped and garbled it was. Melody... I had dropped my phone to the floor when I clapped my hands over my ears. I didn't remember even doing that, but now I leaned down to grab it. 
There was a huge crack across the screen that split Gabriella's face in half, rendering it into something strange and unknown. Abruptly, the call ended. Panic and fear crashed over me. I was suddenly horribly, dreadfully afraid. But why? The sound of the bells had changed again. They didn't sound like sweet, unearthly music anymore, but like the sound of an animal in pain. I waited for the ringing to end, but instead it grew louder, until it was a bestial roar. The ground began to shake under my feet, sending me stumbling. It was like the earth itself was screaming. I blundered away from the sound of the bells, running away without knowing where I was going. All they knew was that I needed to get away. My past to countless trees that all looked the same to me. I jumped over fallen logs and ducked under low branches. At one point, I tripped and landed on my hands and knees, only to scramble back up without a pause. I ran until there was a stitch in my side and I could barely breathe. Finally, my body forced me to stop. I looked around myself as I gasped for breath. Crap. It didn't look anywhere familiar, and there was something different about my surroundings. A subtle difference that I couldn't put my finger on, like asking someone to puzzle out like one of those optical illusions, where you could see both a vase and two faces at the same time. The trees were wrong, but I didn't know why. I pulled out my phone. It was at 42% battery, but there was a no signal. Of course. How worse could my luck get? I pulled up a text message and prepared to send it to, to 911. I read somewhere that you could text them and it would go through when there was a signal again. My fingers were actually hovering over the send button when I paused, uncertain. What the heck had happened just now? What had happened was some idiot in the woods, thinking that he was by himself, decided to blast some weird YouTube video. Stupidly, I got spooked. I tried to articulate to myself why the sound had become so scary, but I couldn't. I felt increasingly like an idiot. I thought back to the ground shaking under my feet. It had to have been an earthquake, right? I was so used to them growing up in California but the East Coast didn't get earthquakes, maybe an occasional sinkhole. I looked around myself, but the trees all looked the same to me, no matter how different I sensed them to be. There was something about moss on trees, right? That it pointed north, and you were supposed to follow a stream towards upwards or downwards of the way that it flowed. I wasn't a wilderness expert, I couldn't go wandering around. I had to stay put. My face burned in embarrassment as I imagined the look on my dad's when he heard about this. My parents had always been so proud of my ability to be self-sufficient, to be practical and calm. I looked down on my phone, preparing to seal my shame by sending that text message, but the screen had turned entirely black. Six words glowed in scarlet red. Centered in all that darkness so that they jumped out at me. They hunt at night. Keep running. I can't, I whispered. All that fear that had seemed too stupid and irrational a moment ago was back. My stomach rolled uneasily, and I had to sit down or fall down because my knees could no longer hold me. I chose to sit cradling the phone in my hands and unable to tear my attention away from it, like I expected the words to change before my eyes. And I passed out. When I woke up, it was cold and dark. For one brief second, I thought that I was safe at home, and only cold because I had kicked my blanket off my bed. That peace didn't last. I remembered that I was alone and lost in a creepy forest. Hooray. I knew that I shouldn't move around when in the dark. I was likely to get myself more lost instead of less. But I couldn't stay still either. It's hard to explain, unless you've experienced it yourself. Have you ever felt the darkness press on your skin like a physical presence? 
felt an itch between your shoulder blades from the weight of countless eyes watching you. As illogical as it was, I had to move. Staying still in the dark was to give up and die, or to go insane. But I understood now the legend of Prometheus, why he had pitied humans and risked everything to steal fire for us. It wasn't just food that fire gave us, but light. Light to chase away the shadows, to show you what was really there. I didn't have fire, but I did have a flashlight function on my phone. It worked, even though the light was weak and barely there, and even though my screen was still entirely black. Was it possible that I'd hallucinated those words? I kept moving forward, unable to see anything past the beam of my flashlight. I don't know how long I stumbled through the darkness, only that at some point I realized that the darkness had lightened somewhat. And then I saw that there were less trees around me, and I didn't need my flashlight anymore. I clicked it off, looking up into the sky. Three moons hung there, full and silver. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and shook my head. But there were still three moons. And the more that I stared at them, the more they seemed like the blank eyes of some giant dead creature staring back at me. I have a head injury, I thought. Maybe that's why I passed out for so long too. Was having brain damage better or worse than a psychotic break? I didn't know. I began to leave the cover of the tree, to cross what I was pretty sure was a clearing, but the sounds of bells ringing came again. Some inner instinct, one that had slumbered while the dream of civilization wrapped itself around me in a cocoon, told me not to move. So I held myself still and stared at the clearing, parts of which were illuminated by beams of that strange silver moonlight. A door opened in the middle of the clearing. For a confused moment, I thought maybe there was a house there, that the white door made of gleaming bones was connected to something larger. And then they came pouring out of that door, pouring out of the darkness. Their skin glowed in the darkness, white and corpse pale. Some of them scuttled forward on two legs, others on three or five or eight. I couldn't make out their faces in the darkness, and for that, I was glad. What little I could see was awful enough. At first, I thought once more that there was a house in the clearing, and that there were Christmas lights strung all around it. But no, it was their eyes. No human had eyes like that. Their eyes glowed red, green, red, green, yellow. I could see groups of them clustered together like the eyes of some giant spider. When I dropped my gaze down to these shadows that they cast, I saw that some of their lower faces writhed, like the mandibles of a praying mantis. Others had strange, limb-like appendages on their faces that cast shadows on the ground that waved and curled. I knew that I should move, but I didn't want to draw the attention of these things. When I looked at them, their faces shrouded in the darkness but gleaming with malevolence. I didn't think aliens. I thought monsters then that felt right. They were the nightmares of nightmares. So I stayed still and tried to figure out how to move backwards silently when they were probably countless twigs hiding behind me, ready to be loudly snapped by a careless hand or foot. The monsters began to cross the clearing. I realized with another flash jolt of terror that they moved in my direction. I couldn't just stay still. I glanced around helplessly, wondering if I could somewhere hide nearby. I don't know what I would have done, run or hide because just then, they all stopped as one. And the first monster, the one in front of all the others, called out. Come out, come out, wherever you're hiding. It said. I had expected their voices to match the horror of their appearance. I expected a harsh and guttural voice, or maybe an alien chittering, like the insects some of them resembled. But instead, 
Its voice rang out like the sweet sounds of wind chimes. We won't hurt you. Not unless you make us search for you. It seemed impossible that it, that they, knew I was there, but what if they could see in the dark? Or what if they had an incredible sense of smell? I took quick, shallow breaths, breathing carefully out of my mouth to minimize the sound of my breathing. Yet at the same time, it had an almost irresistible urge to stand up. It was like the feeling you get sometimes. When you're standing at the edge of a cliff or bridge and you think about jumping. I wanted this to be over. The terror that I felt waiting for them to find me was greater than the terror I felt at what they would do to me. And as little sense as it made, part of me trusted their words. That they wouldn't hurt me unless I made them hurt me. For some reason I couldn't explain. I looked down at my phone then. There were words again, glowing out of the darkness. Stay still. And I stayed still. And eventually, something else moved. Someone else. He, she, or they, I couldn't tell. Stood up out of the bushes that weren't even 20 or 30 feet from where I hid. They stumbled toward the creatures in the clearing. And I caught a brief glimpse of the expression on his face because I could tell that it was a him then. Agonized terror. If I had known what they were going to do to him, I would have run. Even if they had heard me, maybe they would have been so busy with him that they wouldn't have bothered to chase me. There are always other knights to hunt, but I didn't know. Couldn't have known what they would do to him. So I stayed and watched. He reached the first thing in the clearing, the one standing up in front of the others and who had spoken. He dropped to his knees and trembled, saying nothing. The creature reached out. I couldn't see exactly what they were doing to him, but he began to scream. High, piercing shrieks. If I hadn't seen his face and known that he was a man, I would have thought it was a girl screaming. I huddled with my arms circling my knees in as small a ball as I could manage. I locked my jaw against the scream that was clawing its way out of my chest. My heart pounded like it was going to burst out of me and run, steaming into the night. A thick spray of red, black in the moonlight, splashed across the clearing. The figure staggered, toppling backwards. I had time to notice that he looked strangely lopsided, unbalanced. And then the creatures all moved in around him, blocking him from my view. But still, he screamed and screamed. I don't know how long he screamed for, only that by the end of it, his voice had turned into hoarse barks. And under the sound of that, slurping sounds from the clearing, from the things around him. Please leave, I thought. I prayed. Please go away. I stayed curled up in a ball, my entire body sore and aching from the position. I was so cold, cold like I had never felt, but I didn't move and I couldn't. I stayed that way, my eyes straining to make out perverse, twisted shapes in the darkness, until eventually, I heard a wet tearing sound and these screams ended. I heard laughter like silver bells, church bells echo across the clearing, and then nothing. Eventually dawn spread its fingers across the sky, and I saw that the clearing was empty. Well, almost empty. I hadn't heard or seen them leave, and somehow that was even more terrifying. I tried to look around myself to get up at the same time, but I fell over, stiff muscles refusing to cooperate. There was nothing, no one behind me. I limped around in a circle trying to stretch out my muscles. After a while, I moved towards the clearing. I didn't want to see and I wanted to see at the same time. There was a tiny part of me that still couldn't believe what had happened. Surely, said that part of me, surely it couldn't have been as bad as what you thought it was. When I saw him, I didn't know at first what I was looking at. 
because it wasn't human. It was a pile of meat decorated with glistening organs. Ropes of it spilled out of that pile, and I saw that it soaked the grass below in a deep red. It was still wet and fresh, and the metallic smell of it clung to me. I kept trying to make it make sense, but there was nothing that I could make sense of. Nothing of it that resembled a human, or even limbs or hands or feet. Those things had reduced him to nothing. I threw up right beside him, unable to stop myself. The thought that I was desecrating what remained of him just made me throw up even more. It wasn't until I had thrown up everything my stomach held that I was able to get up. I walked away calmly. I could still see that pile of flesh every time I closed my eyes, but I kept going. My throat burned, both from throwing up and from thirst. The fear had made me forget how thirsty and hungry I was, but now it was back. Everywhere that I turned, the trees looked the same as each other, and I couldn't hear the sound of running water anywhere. I suddenly knew with a bone-deep certainty that I was going to die. If the things from last night didn't get me, then dehydration would. I was only 16, too young to go, but I was going to. I thought of my dad and told myself not to cry. That that would just make my dehydration worse, and I cried anyway. I couldn't stop myself. I sank against the nearest tree and sobbed so hard that I tasted that coppery taste in my throat. My phone buzzed in my hand. I looked at it on instinct, and even through the tears, I saw the words. Stream on right. Keep going. I tried to type something in response, but there was no keyboard under my fingers. Nothing that I could press. I held the power button down, cursing myself for not thinking of that sooner. But that didn't work either. The frustration mounted and I thought very seriously about throwing the phone into the woods. But instead, I held the phone close to my face, as if I was going to talk to someone. Who are you? What is going on? I looked down at my phone and saw that the words had changed. I guess I should have been scared or worried, but I was so exhausted that I didn't feel anything at all. When reality thins, doors open. How do I get out of here? The words didn't change, so I tried again. What were those things? They hunt. Yeah, I got that. I heaved in one shaky breath after another. How do I... How do I get away from them? The sound of bells will warn you. Okay, okay, I laughed. And even through my exhaustion, I could hear the edge of hysteria in it. It sounded like the laugh of someone unhinged. So I stopped. How do I get out of here? When reality thins, doors open. I did throw my phone then. It bounced off a tree and shot into the woods. And then I heard the sound of my phone ringing and I ran towards it. Dropping down on my hands and knees. Desperately shuffling through the leaves until my hand touched a cold metal. Hope burned inside of my chest like glowing embers. Hello? Hello? I practically screamed the words, and my throat reminded me anew of how much it hurt. There was a loud burst of static, and I held it away from myself, wincing. Melody. It was a woman's voice, one that I knew well. I nearly dropped my phone. Mom? I whispered. It couldn't have been her. She was dead. She was dead. Melody. You have to. A burst of static. Find the door. Please, help me, Mom. I was crying again so hard that I almost couldn't speak. I need help. Door. And then the call ended. I stared at the phone waiting, but there was nothing else. No words, no phone call. Had that really been my mom? It sounded like her, but I knew she was gone. She had died two years ago. So much ground meat from the car crash. I got up. The phone clenched in my left hand so tightly that my fingers were numb. And then I began walking. 
to the right to where the stream supposedly was. What else could I do? I'm so scared. I think I'm safe for now. I think I have until the sun sets again. They hunt a night after all, but what do I do then? For how long can I run or hide? I don't know if you'll see this. I don't know if any of this is getting through. But if you do, please send help. My name is Melody and I'm trapped in the great north woods in Maine. I know my dad will be looking for me. Please let him know that I'm okay. At least for right now. And whatever you do, if you hear bells ringing in the forest, run.